Hello and uh, welcome to my quickie about uh, 15 Kubernetes features in 15 minutes. I'm uh, Mark Schlüter, I'm uh, working for Luminous Technologies, I'm from Germany. I'm uh, mainly busy with uh, projects with Java, but recently also with uh, some Go and Angular 2. I'm uh, at Luminous Technologies, I'm working on uh, three projects. The first thing, first thing is Amdatu. It's an open, uh, Amdatu is a set of open source components which can be used for modular uh, Java development based on OSGI. Then uh, last year I was mainly busy with the Inetics project. That is an uh, open source project about uh, researching uh, how to work with uh, modular distributed applications. And uh, this year I was mainly busy with uh, Cloud RTI, that is our runtime infrastructure for hosting uh, Dockerized applications in the cloud, which also at least partly uh, has some open source components, for example, a Kubernetes Java client. Let's talk uh, about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is uh, Greek for helmsman or pilot and is used for orchestrating Docker containers in a cluster. Um, the main thing about Kubernetes is you declare what you want to run and Kubernetes tries to reach this state. Kubernetes was started by Google in the year 2014 and is based on uh, over 10 years of experience with their internal uh, container platform called Borg. The first official release was in July of last year, 1.0 release. In the meanwhile, we are at 1.4 with 1.5 in the pipeline. Uh, Google donated Kubernetes to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in the meanwhile. It's 100% open source and it's written in Go. Uh, let's start with the first feature of Kubernetes. Uh, in uh, Kubernetes, the smallest deployable unit is a pod. A pod is a small group of tightly coupled containers which share network and data volumes. Most times, you even have only one container in a pod, so that's uh, quite valid. Um, shared network means that the containers can communi communicate each other over local host, and the shared data volume, so yeah, can share files uh, in uh, some volumes. Every pod gets a routable IP, but you have to keep in mind that pods are mortal. That means you have no guarantee that they are running forever. They can be restarted and can be restarted on another node, and then they get a new IP address. We will come to back uh, that. We come back to that later on. Um, you don't create pods yourself. Pods are created by replica sets. Replica sets are intended for running a specified number of uh, copies called replicas of your pod. If uh, there are less pods running already, then the replica set will start up a new pod. If there are too many pods running, it will kill pods. Um, Replica sets also make usage of uh, health checks in order to uh, check if a pod is uh, running fine. If it's not, it will be restarted. Health checks can be just basic checks if the Docker container is still running or some uh, application defined health checks. Uh, replica sets are created by deployments. Uh, de deployments finally contain the declaration of your containers which you want to run in a cluster. Um, that means the image and the tag environment variables which we want to use and the data volumes you want to use. So basically everything which you, you, would, uh, you would use normally in a docker run command uh, on your machine. You also define the number of replicas for the replica set and then uh, the uh, Kubernetes creates the replica sets and the pods based on your information in this deployment. You can edit deployments. What will happen then? This is a nice uh, feature. Uh, so um, you can, Kubernetes will then make rolling updates. That means your deployment will create a new replica set for the new version of your application. It will create the first pod and then will, will scale down the old replica set with your old pods. And that is an altern alternating process. If something goes wrong, the Kubernetes will, Kubernetes will stop scaling up and down the replica sets and you can issue a rollback to your old version. Then, as I said, pods are mortal but you want to somehow uh, access them. Um, I, I said they uh, can get a new IP address when they are restarted. So here we have services. Services provide a stable IP address and a D DNS name for your pods. They will proxy the traffic to the selected pods and will also do some load balancing, balancing if you have uh, more than one replica. Um, mainly services are used for internal communication within your cluster only. 
but usually you want to uh, access your pods also from the outside. That makes sense for web applications, for example. Here we have ingresses. Ingresses expose services to the outside world. They uh, map a URL and uh, to services. It can also handle SSL termination. Um, for an ingress, you need an ingress provider. When you're running uh, your Kubernetes cluster in a public cloud, for example at Amazon, then Amazon will provide an uh, ingress provider with their own uh, internal load balancer, the same for Google. But if you want to run your cluster on your uh, private cloud, you can use until now only an uh, NGINX controller uh, provider. Um, that's at the moment the only one offered by Kubernetes, but there are uh, more to come. Um, let's come to the next feature, it's namespaces. Namespaces group Kubernetes resources like the pods and uh, replica sets and deployments and services I just mentioned. Normally, everything is in a default namespace, but uh, most likely you want to create new namespaces. So, for example, for your uh, test staging and production environments or for different clients of your cluster, so this offers uh, some kind of multi-tenancy. You can then restrict uh, access to, uh, to namespaces to the Kubernetes users. Namespaces can also have separated networks, but that depends on the network provider you are using. Uh, then I mentioned already clusters. Clusters are a set of virtual or physical machines, and you need to run one Kubernetes master and at least one Kubernetes worker node on it. There is also a quite new thing called cluster federation. So you can, call, uh, you can create a, a federation master and register all your clusters at that master, and then you can distribute your application through different clusters. This can be useful if you have, for example, a cluster in, uh, at Amazon North America and one at Amazon Europe, uh, so you can distribute your applications through these clusters. Um, so this is basically everything you need to run your application in Kubernetes, but there are some more useful uh, features you want or even need to use. The first one I want to talk about are secrets and config maps. So you want, don't want to have your configuration inside of your Docker image. So here you can use secrets and config maps. Uh, config, config maps. Uh, both are basically key value stores which can be read during runtime of the container by the container, while, while the values of secrets are binaries, for example, for uh, certificates and keys, and the values of config maps are string values. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Then probably you want to have some data in your uh, uh, pods. So I mentioned that them already you can use data volumes. They map some uh, file system or virtual file system into your running containers. I already mentioned that uh, several containers in the same pod share the same file system. There are uh, several volume types. So, um, one is, for example, a temporary empty directory, which uh, will be deleted when the pod goes down, but can be used for exchanging data between two pods. Uh, then, of course, in the public cloud providers, you can use the Google Persistent Disk or the Amazon Blob Store, and there are uh, some more. Uh, there are two possibilities to use data volumes. One thing is, as a user of Kubernetes, you define everything uh, yourself in your uh, pod or the deployment, or the administrator of the cluster can pre-configure uh, some data volumes, and you just say, I want to use that one without having to deal with the uh, exact configuration of, for example, Amazon Blob Store. Then the next step for stateful uh, pods are pet sets. A pet is basically a stateful pod, and a pet set can run one or more of these pets. The pet is bound to a dynam dynamically created data volume. That's the difference to having a normal replica set with a data volume. Uh, because in a normal replica set, every pod will use the same data volume, here everyone gets its own. And that data volume will never be deleted, so on a restart of the pod, it will always get his own data volume back. Um, that's it about data. Um, sometimes you want to run some short running task. If you want to run this using Kubernetes, you can use jobs. 
Jobs are used in order to uh, run a container only once in your cluster, or you can define that you want to need it twice or whatever, it's configurable. And Kubernetes ensures that this container or this pod runs at least, for example, once successful. So when it's not successful, it tries to restart the pod on another node maybe until uh, it was successful. You can also use schedule jobs, which are then uh, some kind of uh, cron jobs. So these uh, jobs pod will be uh, started at uh, times which you can configure. Then sometimes you want to run a pod on each node in your cluster. It's for example for uh, uh, running pods which uh, handle with uh, logging or monitoring. This we can do with uh, daemon sets. Then, the next interesting thing, autoscaling. Until now, there are two types of autoscaling. The first one is the horizontal pod autoscaling. That means that a replica set will uh, scale itself based on, uh, on the CPU usage of the pod it is running or based on uh, some application-defined uh, metrics. The other one is the cluster autoscaling that must be provided by a cloud provider, for example, Amazon or Google. This means that the cluster will start new nodes, so no new virtual machines for your cluster when uh, CPU and memory usage is uh, too high. Uh, yeah. Then, one very nice thing about Kubernetes is it has a very nice uh, REST-based API. So it's easy to integrate Kubernetes into your existing uh, environment and workflows, for example, in order to uh, use continuous delivery. There is also a nice command line tool called uh, kubectl, which is internally also using this REST API. And then last but not least, community. There is an ins a constantly growing uh, community it's uh, used uh, by uh, more and more companies. There is a, a vibrant discussion on uh, Stack Overflow and Google Groups and on uh, Slack. There are many contributors to the source code of Kubernetes from many companies in the meanwhile. And it, it even has its own conference. So uh, yesterday and today there is a conference, KubeCon, in Seattle with uh, around 1,000 attendees. Yesterday, they announced the next uh, KubeCon in Europe will be in Berlin in March 2017, and they have capacity for 1,500 attendees. And next the year's December, the next edition in the United, United States will be in Austin, and they have capacity for 3,000 attendees. So I have two minutes left. Are there any questions? At least I don't see someone. Okay, then uh, I say thank you for, uh, for your attention. Have fun with Kubernetes. And here finally some links. Thank you. <laughs>